my humble respect to Guru Mahan, Guru Piran Sarasankaran, Guru Piran Nyo, fellow Jainis. Uh, today I'm going to complete the fourth part of uh, this um, chariot model. Sorry, actually the third part uh, of the chariot model, which will bring everything to a conclusion. So let's recap what we did the last time, right? A chariot is a very good metaphor for our own life. So we covered this in, so this is the, what the chariot model looks like. And uh, there are 11 stations. Most, most books would cover only four, but here I've nuanced it into more detail because there are some really uh, significant and profound things that I want to uh, you know, explain to you. So here we see that uh, in the last class, um, we covered uh, the following. We covered pretty much from one to uh, you know, eight, you know, the subconscious mind, you know, from the, uh, the part of the pathway, path that we travel to the, the body and, and so on. And we covered right up to, um, you know, uh, uh, part station eight, which covers the mechanism of experience. So within the mechanism experience, you've got station three to station 10. So we covered up to station eight in terms of, um, you know, uh, the subconscious mind uh, and where, you know, the instructions from the passenger comes and how the mind needs to be. So this is information that is already embedded in our mind. Only the mind that is very quiet will be able to tap into this knowledge. And this is where, you know, introspection, contemplation, reflection, meditation, research is crucial. So we covered up to uh, part eight. Today, I'm going to cover uh, the remaining parts, which is the instruction. What is the instruction that is embedded in all of us? I spoke about last week that this mind, um, you know, within our mind, we get knowledge from the external world, but there's also knowledge that is embedded in us. Nature's, you know, embedded that knowledge in us. So, and today we're going to see what is that knowledge in part nine, which is the instruction. What is that wisdom knowledge? And that is referred to as the bow and arrow, right? And, uh, and I'll explain what that details are. And then one is the bow and arrow. The 10th station is actually the hold between the passenger and the bow and arrow. And that has got a very important deep meaning to it too. Right. And the last one, the 11th station, is actually the passenger itself. That soul or the jiva or the atma or the paranjodi or the big guy. So that is what the, the chariot is carrying. And there is a um, driver, which we refer to as the mind. Right. And there are various, fac various, various facets of that mind, which we covered. So let me take you through to station nine, and then we'll go to station 10 and station 11, and then I'll put the whole story together. Right. So what is this? So we spoke about the chariot model and station nine is the instruction, that wisdom knowledge, and it's captured by the bow and arrow, right? And what that bow and arrow actually means is actually, the bow is actually our body or brain. That's the physical aspect. And if you see the bow is made out of material that is strong but bendable. This has got very important meaning. So which means that our brain or our mind or our body must be made out of material that is strong and bendable. That means the body needs to be healthy, the brain needs to be healthy, and the mind needs to be healthy. So here in this chariot, that bow is referred to as the body, the brain, and the mind. It has to be steady and strong. It cannot be like a porcelain looks very hard, but you drop it, it shatters. It has to be like a, a, a you know, somewhat like flexible and agile, right? I, I like to call 
the mind that is smart. Smart means it's seamlessly integrated. The first S is seamless integration. The body is seamlessly integrated everything. The M is actually, it is moral. That means it's discipline. And it's also mobile in the sense that it is able to be agile, like the bow, right? The A in that is actually adaptability, to be able to adapt to every conditions and circumstances. And that's what the mind, the Dharmic knowledge teaches us. The R is actually responsiveness and resilience. So the body and the mind and the brain needs to be resilient and responsive. And the last one is that the T in that smart is transformative and transcendentality. So the mind that need the smart mind is one that is seamlessly integrated and simple, keeps it very not complicate things. You know, the M is moral and mobility. A is adaptability and agility. R is responsiveness and also, you know, resilience. And the T is transformative and transcendental. So this is what that bow and arrow refers to a body mind that is strong but can withstand anything. If the bow is weak, you'll see that, you know, the arrow which is depicted by a very sharp intellect and mind, right? So the arrow is actually the, sorry, the string is actually the intellect. So the string is tied to that body mind sorry, the, the body, the brain that is solid, right? So this is why it's very important to keep the body fit, keep the brain fit. You know, how do we keep the brain fit? Because we want to make sure that the neural pathways are strong. And this is where meditating, concentrating, giving mental exercise, reading, reflecting, you know, all this is so important to strengthen the body, the nerves, you know, and also the neural pathway, keeping it fit. The string refers to the intellect, the jnana, right? And as how the body must be made out of material that is flexible, you know, and strong, the string too needs to be made out of material that is strong and is able to be flexible. So here, the string is referred to as the jnana, the, our intellect. Our intellect needs to be sharp, deep, and also amiable. And the arrow is the mind. So arrow here refers to the mind. It has to be sharp with pointedness. Now you put all that together. Think about this. If the bow is weak, and when you pull the string, the bow breaks, the arrow cannot go anywhere. Right. Similarly, if the bow is strong and if the string is weak and the string snaps, the arrow doesn't go anywhere. So you need both the bow and the, you know, the string to be strong, and the arrow too needs to be sharp. Right. And when you do that, when you pull the thing and you let go with deep concentration, the mind is able to hit its target. So the aim here is that the mind's aim is the direction to the universal personality or the big eye or the Brahman. So the bow needs to be strong. The string needs to be made out of material that is flexible and strong, such that when you pull to give the fullest force, it would not snap or the bow would not break. And that force gives you that, you know, the momentum for that, arrow to fly and get to its target. The target is actually the Brahman, you see, or big eye or the self-realization path. So what this tells us is that, that wisdom knowledge is about body, senses, mind, and intellect needs to be in unison with the self, you see? And, you know, so they all has to be, so when you are the archer, you need to know the temperament of the bow. You need to know the strength of the string. And you need to also be focused with the arrow, right? Without that focus and sharpness, you see that 
you know, you would not exert the optimal force for that arrow to travel. So when the arrow hits the target, right, we say that the mind attains that state of Brahman or, or Paramatma or that Paranjodhi. So see here that this is what Swamiji means by the convergence between the small eye and the big eye. But that requires understanding that instructions of the wisdom knowledge. For that, the bow needs to be strong. The string needs to be strong and, and flexible. The arrow needs to be sharp. And with that concentration and the direction, you see that one gets to that path. And, and this is what that instruction is, this dharmic instruction of that focus and so on. That's why I always say introspection, contemplation, reflection. That actually strengthens the brain, gives it focus. The neural pathway expands. Intellects become sharp. The mind becomes focused. And you see that attainment of the self-realization becomes, um, you know, great. And there are some beautiful quotes by, you know, Rumi that says that, you know, this path of understanding this knowledge, he says, I'll be the seeker. And I am still, that means that learning process. But I stopped asking the books and the stars. I started listening to the teaching of my soul. What he's saying here is that the mind has become so focused that it's merged with that soul force. It's become one. It has got in, it's, it hit its target. In that same way, you see, Mahan also speaks about this this instruction. He says that the divine wealth of the knowledge was increased through this introspection, contemplation, reflection. Being merged in the superconscious state of knowledge, I revel in that bliss in my own temple. So he's talking about this focus, understanding this knowledge, this instruction, and by knowing this knowledge of the superconsciousness, I'm able to take my mind to that state, that temple, my own temple of bliss. So this is what Swamiji is also saying about this instruction. And many, many masters have spoken about this. So, and here is a message from Mundaka Upanisha. It talks about this arrow. It says, holding that great bow of Upanishadic wisdom, aspiration should fix the arrow of the mind, sharpen with meditation on its target. So that introspection, contemplation, reflection, meditation, takes you to the direction of that self-realization. He says, draw the string with full absorption and shoot at the target. So, oh, my friend, remember this immutable eternal truth alone is the target. So the target for a Mahan is not the material world. The target for the Mahan is actually that big eye or the Brahman or the Paranjodhi. And when the mind rests and achieves that target, everything becomes Brahman, everything becomes big eye, everything becomes that universal identity. So this is what this chariot is trying to tell us, that wisdom knowledge. What's that wisdom knowledge in more detail? So here is the wisdom knowledge that I tried to put together of Swamiji's teachings, of that convergence between the small eye and the big eye. The instruction is that. Yes, we have five senses, the multiplicity state, the five information that is coming to us. That five information, when it arrives to our mind, we have to uh, continue. You know, the mind oscillates between the sukhas, the things that we like, and the things that we do not like. Some sukhas are very high, and some dukkhas are very low. So people oscillate between the two. And most people are in that first two state. Right? But as one practices meditation, you see that slowly the mind that is oscillating between the sukha and dukkha starts attaining quietude, start attaining the tranquility, start attaining the sublimity, and slowly, slowly the oscillations Initially, high oscillations it slowly starts tapering off, and you get to this beautiful state of the samatva equanimity. Right? So the mind starts anchoring not from the noise from outside or the material, the gravity of the materiality, but slowly anchors onto the divine DNA that is 
imprinted in all of us, the unarva, the vibration, the divine vibration, the universal vibration. The mind starts getting into that meditative state and you see that you know, our, our mental waves start settling down. And this is, you know, our mind is starting to now um, harmonize with the life force in us, which is transcendental to the material thoughts. And as we push further in this deep meditation phase, we come to that final universal state. That's the arrow that is hitting the target. And that universal state, you know, this is, you know, prior to the primordial state or the Yiru, this state, you know, the, our waves become really calm and cool, you know, less than four hertz. We can measure the brain waves now. And what happens is that you attain that beautiful state of silence realization as Rumi spoke about and Mahan spoke about. In that, that limited material identity start dissipating and you start getting into that much more expanded consciousness state. This is the E in that self. And you attain that state of liberation not impacted by this material cause and effect. The sugas and dukkhas disappears. The waves disappear. And finally, you realize that, hey, I am that. That which is transcendental to everything. So the self is actually about that silence realization. That instruction is about that self-realization knowledge, which is silence realization. In that silence, one attains that expanded consciousness. In that expanded consciousness, one attains that liberation from that oscillation of sugha and dukkha, birth and death. And finally, you realize that I am that. This is the essence of the I God philosophy. This is the instruction that all the great masters over the years have been trying to explain to us. You see that the oscillations in our mind start settling down. As the oscillations start settling down, the bandwidth of our neural pathway becomes more expanded. You jump from 1G to 5G. Suddenly now you can understand things, you can process things, you can analyze things at a much more faster rate. The comprehension becomes more faster. So this is the instruction, right? Now, so the ninth station is about that instruction. And actually the instruction is about the I God philosophy. The instruction is about what all the great saints and sages have been speaking about that self-realization, that God realization state. The 10th station is about where does the instruction come from? The instruction comes from that universal cosmic intelligence. And I'll define who that is. But assume you have that that's coming from some higher transcendental state to all of us, embedded in all of us. So what that is, is that actually that self that we are talking about, that cosmic intelligence, that knowledge comes from that. And that knowledge is referred to as the bow and the arrow. Right? But that wisdom knowledge comes, and if you see that the grip that the the, the the self holds and the mind is how strong the mind is in wedded and being wedded and welded to that self. If the grip is weak, can you imagine if the grip is weak, the mind would not be able to hold the bow and the arrow would not be able to have good flight. So what this chariot is telling us is that for that instruction to be properly executed, that knowledge must be held very, very closely between the self, intellect, and the mind. That bond is so important. right? So that self, intellect, mind bond will not happen if we are so engaged in the material world. You know? It happens in that quietude. And this is why it is so important that every day we allocate the time for us, for the mind, to understand this instruction, and in that instruction, become one with the self. And this is what the self-realization process is. <clears throat> so the self-realization process is to be for the mind to hold on to that instruction that comes from the instructor. That self-realization process is 
for the knower to know who the knower is and the knowing process and holding that knowledge very, very tightly. Right? So when you hold that instruction very tightly from that knower, that mind ultimately becomes that knower. So here, uh, very beautifully, again, Rumi says that I searched for God and found only myself. And I searched myself and I found only God. So when that wedded and weldedness happens between the mind and the self, the mind would not be able to differentiate itself from the self. As long as the mind is caught up in that material world, the mind will always have that limitedness. When that mind slowly quietens the material world and gets into this realm of that self, the mind takes on that personality of the self. The mind is like water. Whatever container you put, it'll take that shape. In the same way, if you put it in a limited container, it takes the limited form. But when you remove the container, the water becomes flexible to take on whatever that you know, container, containerless state of existence. So that whole, the 10th station is so important. And where does it come from? Where does the instruction come from? Ah, this is the part that is so important. The passenger is none other than the jiva, the soul, the atma that is embedded in this body, the true driver of the body, this transcendental, eternal nature of that universal personality. Swamiji says it's very subtle. This is the formless, dimensionless. This passenger is spoken about in every religion. Everybody speaks about this. Man spoke about it in the Nan Kadavul as big eye. You know, you see all the four Vakyas, you know. Consciousness is Brahman. I am Brahman. That thou art. This self is Brahman. The Holy Spirit. All those are spoken about in every scripture, about this passenger that we carry with us every day, but yet we don't know. So this chariot makes reference to the path, the gross body, the more subtle body of mind, you know, that has got multiple states, the driver, and ultimately the passenger itself. So we see this, you know, in all our lives, so we have the 11 stations and in the ordinary person, you know, transitions from that experience, that object gross world from one, two, we have the path, and then it makes its way to three, you know, our senses, and then, you know, our, our neural pathway, the information goes, the mind. So we, we transition from that three right up to 10, that mechanism of experience, and if we are lucky, we get to the experience. But most people will stop at that, you know, the, the, the kind of superficial experience of that material world, that sugar dukkhas, that's it, the first two steps. But don't proceed any further. Even the spiritual practices are all very material in nature. A lot of uh, acharas, but very little vicharas, the introspection, contemplation, reflection. So most ordinary human beings transition from one right up to maybe at most, you know, uh, seven or eight. You know. But they don't understand that instruction. What is that instruction? Where does the instruction come from? Who is the, 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 the instructor? This is where the vichara comes in. This is where the deep, so where is all this coming from? So, and you see that, you know, it's like all of us trying to discover this, you know, uh, and we're trying to climb a mountain, you see? And, uh, you know, Mahan beautifully says, that means the abode that I'm trying to reach, I'm attempting to get there and I'm attempting to get there. You know, for many people, it's futile, right? They say, Guru, I'm sitting down for meditation, a lot of thoughts coming. You know, Guru, I can't get this experience, you know. To get that experience, one needs to be consistent. One needs to allocate a time for oneself, at least an hour out of the 24 hours, allocate at least one hour in the morning, 4.30 to 5.30 or 5 to 6. 
just for the introspection, the journey that you make within yourself. Every day you do this, you see that slowly, slowly you can feel that resonation. So one needs to have that spiritual compass to make that journey. That means understanding, spending some time on understanding God and you know the pursuit of the discipline, the bhakti with introspection, contemplation, reflection, and research, you know, that spiritual pursuit, not just theoretically, you know, experiencing it. If this is it, why is this? If a particular ritual is there, why do we have the ritual? What has it got to do with me, right? And using the lens of, you know, rational, you know, reason and logic, and in a very scientific way, I mean, it's transforming our body, our senses, our mind, our intellect as a laboratory for experimentation to push further. Is there something more than what this physical experience is? So this is what an ordinary uh, human beings go through, you know, and uh, sometimes they don't even understand that the path they are traveling and why it's bumpy and how do we prepare for the bumpy road, controlling the senses, you know, managing the senses, listening to the instructions. And if you see very carefully, I've marked here all of them in circle, except five and seven. Five and seven are two crucial transition points in our mind. One is that the mind is holding on to the senses and is passing that instruction to the senses and knowing the senses really well. So this is the transition point of information flow between the senses and the mind. Number five is very important. We need to understand our senses very well. We also need to be able to instruct the senses, the horses, what to do. Number seven is actually the giving that instruction, the intellect mind bond. So one is the bond between the mind and the senses. The other one is between intellect and the mind. So the mind learning to acquire that ability to analyze, make inference, and the intellect is really important. So the transition between the intellect and the mind, that information flow is very important. And the last one, which is the 10th one, which I spoke about, is that the interaction between the spirit or the self and the mind. So you see five, seven, and 10 is something missed out by miss, many people miss out. The ability for the mind to have full control over the senses and two-way flow of information. The ability for the intellect and the mind to bond, the two-way flow between the two, and the ability for the self and the mind to have that beautiful interaction so that the flow of knowledge and information become smooth and seamless, right? So we see this, you know, understanding this is crucial. We're understanding our own chariot. And so most people will struggle. Yes, in the early days, you struggle to climb up. But as you become a, a, a proficient climber, you see that the climbing process, the terrain, you understand things better. Ultimately, over time, you see that it is no more climbing a mountain. Everything starts and ends with you. And in this state, what happens is something very interesting. It is no more from one and two, you go to 11. One who attains that self-realization, the Mahans and the enlightened ones, don't transition from one to 11. It's actually from 11, understanding themselves really well. They understand the mind, the subtle matter, because it is them, the antakarana, the mind is from them. The mechanism of experience is so from them. And the experience, the understanding of the object world, the gross world also becomes very clear. So yes, in the early phase, we go through this. We've got to make that journey, not stop in three and not stop in four but continuously understanding five, the transition between the body, mind, the mind, senses, born. Once one understands, you see that, you know, six, how to sharpen that intellect, you know, and how to build that bond between the intellect and the mind. 
as that strengthens, you push on to eight and nine and 10, and you understand this, the self and that transition between the self and the mind, ultimately the mind merges and suddenly something very interesting happens. And the mind becomes one with that subject. You see that everything is unraveled from it. The whole mechanism of the material mind is understood. You know, the, the, the finiteness of the mind dissipates. You know, the mortal part of the, our material personality also dissipates. What's really interesting is that at this state, you know, one understands that while we have a mortal body, there is something in us that is immortal. While we inherit a perishable body, there is something that is imperishable. While we, you know, are anointed with finiteness, we are also anointed with infiniteness. So you see that the Mahans are not too worried about what people say, poverty, you know, when one understands this, there's no poverty of intellect and poverty of mind. You see, when one understands this, they're not afraid of death, the disease, poverty, ridicule. So you see that the mind becomes so powerful that, you know, nothing perturbs it. The world is understood. All is unraveled from within oneself. So this is what the chariot teaches us. So can you imagine that if you, the mind, realizes it is that self, it has full control over the senses. No matter what the terrain that you're riding, the mind is swift enough to ensure that the journey is, you know, exciting, exhilarating. Even the sharp corners are taken beautifully. Even how rough the road is, you can gallop, you know, very well. And you see that, you know, Scars become stars. What is impossible becomes impossible. Treasures become treasures, right? So we see that these great saints and sages, the mind becomes so light that, you know, it just flows beautifully. So this is what the chariot, understanding our own chariot. So the transition point five, seven, and 10 is sometimes missed out in, in most of the discussions. And I want you to think about it a little bit more carefully. So we see that an ordinary life, you know, we go through the bumpy roads, but for a, someone who has mastered this, you see that the road could still be like the red road, but their experience is a very harmonious experience, right? With the spiritual compass, they're able to navigate through continuously transitioning, every state of our lives, from birth of the body, youth and vitality, late childhood and adolescent, wonderful life. We saw Nachiketa and many, many personalities that have come through midlife. No more midlife crisis anymore. No more menopause, right? You grow, though the hormones are all kind of tapering off and it impacts the body and mind, but you see that when you practice this kind of mindset, you see that your hormones are all harmonized. You gracefully grow, gracefully age. Even if disease and you know comes, you're able to manage it really well until our final step when we slowly transition our body. And life becomes an awesome experience. And this is what living gracefully and beautifully that this great Mahans have been teaching us. So Mahan talks about you know, indirectly when I saw the chariot, what he was explaining here, seeking the inaccessible God, that ceaseless subjective inward search, that not from the external search, that he was discovering his spiritual compass. He was discovering the chariot that would navigate him through that journey, that bow and arrow that will get him to that final destination, which he calls universal peace sanctuary within himself. So here he says that I realize within myself, God in its entirety, not a limited God, it's the infinite but potentiality and possibilities. There's some nice, you know, great people have thought about this. This Alan Watt talks about, you know, enlightenment awakening is not the creation of a new state of affairs. 
but the recognition of what is already there. So this state of enlightenment, this big eye is omnipresent in us. The only thing is that the small eye, the material personality is caught up in the material world. So it's kind of confused. So he says that when we make the journey to the 11th station, and suddenly you flip back and say, hey, all of this is because of that self, not from 1 to 11, right? So here he says that when you, you know, come to the abode, the 11th station of the self, you see that actually that's an omnipresent state. And I, I'd like to conclude by this final quote. He says that enlightenment, what is enlightenment? Imagine going through a door, this great barrier. You know, trying to reach this. So again, here he says that imagine going through a door, this great barrier. When you get in and you look back the other side, you find out that there is no door. Right? So when you hit that 11th station, you look back. Actually, there's no such thing as a material mind. It is an artifact of an unillumined state of existence. And when you become illumined, all that dissipates. Understanding of our life, understanding of our body, understanding of our brain completely changes. Right? So here he says that you know, when one attains that, you see that there is no door. I, you know, I like to come back to this one quote that you probably would have heard many times. We have to think out of the box. I love that quote. Whenever people say that, I say, wow, you know, you've got to think out of the box. I tell you what a Mahan would say. When somebody says, think out of the box, we human beings create this artificial box. We sit inside the artificial box and all our lives trying to get out of the artificial box. Actually, in reality, there is no box, right? We are infinite. So we don't need to create this artificial box and cage ourselves and try all our lives to get up. We have the infinite potential and possibilities. Nothing cages us. Not COVID, not disease, not poverty. Nothing can cage us. And that's what we see that all those great Mahans say, we are infinite potential and possible. Whatever you touch, with that mind, the inspiration mind, you do really well. That's why I say the 10 capitals, you start with the spiritual capital and you see that you touch, your mind will become, build that mental capital. You touch, you know, your intellect, your intellect becomes the beautiful, you know, a, a, a treasure of knowledge and experience and analysis, powerful. The, you, you know, immediately you see that you start becoming creative. And all those things, including finally, when you do all of that, you come to economic capital. You will never be poor in this material world if you have the spiritual capital and all the remaining nine. You always, you may not be a billionaire or a millionaire, but you have enough for yourself, for your family, and supporting the community. You'll never be poor. So this is what this great Mahans teaches. If we master our chariot, no matter how difficult the road is, we'll always have the excitement, exhilaration, the inspiration to ride the journey and come back and say, hey, you know what? The road was bumpy, but I was not bumpy. The road had many selo belo, but yet I was able to navigate it beautifully. And this is what, you know, this chapter on life is about, the perspective of life. Sandosham.